So this is the last in a series that we've done all this year based on this marvellous piece of work by a leading Australian theologian, Father Ken Barker. Thank you, Lord, for Father Ken. Great book, and we've had so many great talks. Really excellent year of teaching this year. So this is the last of them. And I've called it, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's on the last chapter in the book, which is on proclaim the good news. And I don't know, I just read that text or I heard it, I can't remember that text from the beginning of Paul, which is his kind of magnus opus. This is his key work. He was writing to the community in Rome, a community he had not at that point visited, and he was laying out for them quite systematically what he taught, and what he preached, what he was about. Uh, so everything that's written in Romans is very purposefully placed there. And he starts... Almost, it's verse 16 of the first chapter with this amazing thing. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. That's kind of the nutshell for Paul. The key statement, and what a statement. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. And there was no one alive who knew that more than Paul. You know his story, we don't need to rehash it here, it's well known. He was a hater of Christians, a persecutor to to death of Christians, a very effective underminer of the burgeoning new Christian movement. He was its most effective destroyer. A brilliant, appallingly brilliant underminer of the Christian movement. And it was him, that guy, that Jesus chose to appear to with the good news, the good news of his love, his mercy, his power, And Paul, thrown to the ground, experienced everything. The gospel as the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. Interestingly, because he didn't have faith. But through his encounter with the power of God in Jesus, alive from the dead, he came to faith. And his faith has shaped the faith of all of us who follow him as Christians. Just a fascinating concept of being ashamed, or rather being not ashamed. I did my Google search on what shame might mean. And this is, I thought it was a pretty handy definition I found on Google. A painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of of wrong or foolish behavior. A painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. That's shame, and that's exactly what Paul doesn't have. He doesn't have a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior, even though his behavior before he met Jesus was entirely wrong, extremely foolish. But he has no shame because of the gospel, because of the encounter with Jesus the Lord. But it's interesting for us that he he says, I have no shame. Because it almost seems to suggest that, that there is a temptation for those who follow Jesus to experience shame. There is a temptation for those of us who have come to know the saving power of God to experience shame as a consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior because the world, the flesh, and the devil are always telling us that to believe in Jesus, to love Jesus, to follow Jesus as his disciple is wrong and foolish. And if you're honest, and if I'm honest, I've experienced that temptation You know, as someone who has made a good living out of business, for example, who's someone who has a good reputation 
in the industry that I have um, been involved in for the last 30 years. As someone who is respected and has been named the Australian Winemaker of the Year, there is sometimes a temptation, I feel, to dial down, if you will, the most important thing in my life, which is not, despite what some people might believe, the Clonakilla Shiraz Viognier. Now, that is very important to me. That's a, a wine that's become internationally famous, and I developed that wine. That's far from the most important thing in my life. The most important thing in my life is Jesus Christ. But in pursuing my career and becoming successful and in a worldly sense, you know, someone who's achieved things, there is a temptation to dial it back, not to make people uncomfortable. And there was a moment of hesitation when I, when I started my Instagram page. You know, you've got to put a little... Um, what is it, like a bio or some words which kind of say what you are? And I had a moment of hesitation before I decided to go ahead and write, the first thing about me is that I'm a disciple of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. Because I, like Paul, am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. It has been for me. It has been for me. But still I feel a temptation. You know what I'm saying in this world in which we live. All right. I'm interested in this concept of the power of God. Card-carrying charismatic have been for a long time. I've experienced the power of God. And I love the scriptures, as you know, and you do too. I know. And I did a little study preparing for this talk of how often in Paul the word power is used. And it's often, so many times, so many times. And it's usually the, the, the Greek word that Ken loves to quote, which is dunamis, the dynamite power. So just a couple of examples that you know well. Um, 1 Corinthians 2. Chapter 2, verses 3 to 5, My speech and proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in human wisdom. He actually says in the Greek, it's often translated on, but in the power of God. So writing to the Corinthian community, he reminds them, I mean, Paul was, by all accounts, a brilliant speaker, brilliant mind, a very effective communicator, I have no doubt. But what he wants the Corinthians to remember was not whatever words he spoke to them, as plausible as they may or may not have been, but their experience of power. I came not with words of wisdom, plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. How fascinating. What did Paul do in Corinth? Or more accurately, what did the Spirit of Jesus release through him with those people? Something amazing. Something amazing. In my short life, I have on a number of occasions experienced extraordinary spiritual power. It's thrown me to the floor. It's thrown me across a room. It's left me shaking. It's left me screaming when I've encountered it. If that's my experience, what was Paul's experience? What were the Corinthians' experience? He leaves no room for doubt. Something extraordinary. Something powerful. Another text, uh, 1 Corinthians 4.20, this is a cracker. For the kingdom of God depends not in talk, but in power. Same sort of dynamic, isn't it? He's not saying talk is not important. He was always talking. But the kingdom of God, the actual 
God bit, that was an experience of power. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. I love this one. You've heard this so many times. We have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Clay jars, that's what we are. Extraordinary power. Now, I didn't include my notes, but there's also a great text, I think it's 2 Corinthians 6, where he's talking about the trials of his ministry, beatings, shipwrecks, floggings, starvings, hunger, travel, cold nights, sleepless nights. He's talking about all this stuff, and then he starts starts talking about, and we we pursued, we followed with purity, and and, and he talks about the power of God. Even in the context of all his sufferings, Because that's interesting to note too. Paul, definitely charismatic power flowed through him, undeniable. But also so much suffering, so many trials. We've talked this, said this before, every page of the New Testament you'll see that two-sided coin. Extraordinary power, real suffering. Here's a kicker, Romans 15. We started with the beginning of Romans 15. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This is the second last chapter. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, Paul says, to win obedience from the Gentiles by word and deed. By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. Power. I love that. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. Salvation. What do we mean by salvation? It's a power that changes things. It's a power that moves people from one place to another place. It's a power that sets people who've been under the dominion of the devil and and addicted to destructive behavior over themselves and in the lives of others. An encounter with the gospel is an encounter with power that breaks them out of that addiction, that oppression, and sets them on a whole new course of freedom. The power of God for salvation The healing of bodies, broken bodies. How much of Jesus' ministry was healing people? And that was continued in the Acts of the Apostles. It's the power of God for salvation. Moving us from one place to another place. From death to life. From oppression to freedom. From disease to health. Okay, the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. The doorway that you walk through to experience the power of God for salvation is faith. What's faith? It it is, but certainly not limited limited to an acceptance of a set of propositions about God and the world. It does have a a mind element, no doubt about it, but more profoundly still, it's a movement of the heart. It's It's the resounding yes in the core of your being. It's the resounding yes to the person who's in front of you, Jesus Christ, crucified, raised from the dead. I believe in you, Lord. I choose to follow you. I accept you. And I accept your acceptance of me. And I place my trust in you. I give you my life. That's faith. That's the faith, the door. Through You walk through that, you encounter the power of God for salvation. And faith, Paul insists... In chapter 10, from the Romans to the Romans. 
comes from hearing. It comes from being proclaimed. The gospel, the charisma, the message, the good news has to be proclaimed for people, all the brothers and sisters in the human family, to see the door and be able to walk through the door so they can encounter the power of God to save them. It has to be spoken. It has to be preached. Well, who's going to do that? You are. Not just Father Ken or Pope Francis or even me. Every person who has seen the door and walked through it and encountered the power of God to save them. You, you can't keep this news to yourself. Preach, testify, witness, spread it, tell it, share it. You know, I, I, I believe this. I passionately believe this. But I, wonder, I find myself wondering, do you do this too? Like, how, Lord, how now? How, how now? 21st century Australia. How, how about comfortable public service Canberra, this left-leaning city where everyone's so smart and is paid so well? Not everyone, most of us. How do we preach in this context? And I'm, and I'm ashamed to tell you that I, I haven't come with any Easy answers. I reckon that's the question. I reckon that's the question that needs to be resonating loudly in our hearts and our minds. Together, as a community, because we are called to preach. It's not an optional extra. But how are we going to do it? You know, I, I think, I've thought about this for years. And I've been thinking about it more and more lately. Partly because of Ken's book. Because that's the question he kind of raises in that last chapter too. I don't know what we were doing. I think we must have had a, been at a wine dinner in town. For some reason, Lara and I were staying at the Midnight Hotel in Breton. Nice hotel. And I woke up early in the morning, and I had a song in my head. Does it ever happen to you? You wake up with a song in your head? And I'm pretty sure it was a song from the Fisher folk, who are so old that only Murray and Margaret and Ken will remember them. Pete, maybe. The Fisher folk, they were sort of like fantastic, traveling, charismatic, mostly Anglicans in the 70s and 80s. They came to Canberra and did a workshop. They were cool people, really good people, wrote some pretty funky songs. And one of them went something like this. Won't you come, won't you come, for the banquet is laid. Won't you come, for the feast is prepared. I didn't quite do get the tune quite right. But the words, won't you come, won't you come, for the banquet is laid, won't you come, for the feast is prepared. Just going through my head as I woke up in the midnight hotel. I don't know how much Shiraz Vionet we drank the night before, but this is the song. And it dawned on me that at least in part, this was the answer to this question of how. It's to extend an invitation to a banquet. And Ken, Ken picks this up in his book, because of course this isn't my image, it's not Ken's image, it's Jesus' image. In, is it Luke 14, Matthew 22, the image of the, the father who is having a wedding feast for his son. And he invites everybody, and they make excuses. You know the text, I think we had it at Mass the other day, didn't we? They make excuses. I've just got married, I bought property, I'm too busy. Thanks for the invitation, not this time. You know, it's a familiar sort of dynamic and one that we experience in this culture too. People are too busy, they're too important, they're too engaged in social media, they're too engaged in making money. They're too engaged in sport, whatever it is. People are too busy to hear this invitation, the extraordinary invitation to come to the eternal banquet the extraordinary banquet, banquet that Isaiah talks about, I think it's chapter 25, of fine strained wines, extraordinary food, 
dancing company joy celebration. It's an eternal banquet to which every human soul has been invited. And we are the servants in the parable who have to deliver the message. Not everyone's going to come. But we have to do such a good job of delivering the invitation that as many as possible can come. Why? Why is that important? Well, you know, we've, we've been going through this book. And if it's true, what, what we've been talking about this year, like if it's true that death, which is going to come to every human person, that it's not the end. If that's true. If it's true that a judgment is in all of our future, that every human person will stand naked, if you will, before God. If that's true. If it's true that there is, in fact, a community, a communion of saints, of people who've gone before us, who are united to the Father, in the Son, through the Spirit. If that's true. If it's true that heaven is real. And is in fact the very thing we were created for. And if it's true that purgatory is the essential healing that all of us go through on the way to heaven. And if it's also true that hell, the absence of the love of God, is real for those foolish enough to choose it, the absence. That's what we've been going through. And if it's true that our bodies are eternal, that these bodies transformed, resurrected, will be with us, will be us forever. And if it's true that Jesus will return as king to judge the living and the dead. And if it's true that creation is in fact, as Paul says, groaning in one great act of giving birth. And that heaven and earth will be married and joined together into eternity. If that's true, if what we profess as Catholic Christians is true, then there's nothing more important for everyone to know. There's nothing, no, no achievement, no awards, no status, no money, no possessions, no growth in reputation, no social media following, no, nothing is more important than knowing what's true. It all fades in the light of that truth. That's why we have to tell people. Simply because it's true. I don't want anyone to go to hell. I, I, I struggle with hell. I, 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 I've, I've, I've encountered the love of God. I know a tiny bit of how amazing God is, how beautiful He is, how pure is that love. The idea of someone being outside of that, it, it terrifies me that anyone. But if it's true, we have to tell the truth. All right. Jump over that bit and finish with this bit quickly. Father Ken's 10 Essentials for Evangelization. Quick. Here we go. One, we ourselves must be deeply convinced of the truth of Jesus. 
Do you know that it's true? Ask the Spirit to pierce your heart with the truth. He is, after all, the Spirit of truth. We ourselves must be deeply convinced of the truth of Jesus, of eternal life, and of the urgency of salvation. Number two, it's all in Ken's book. Great chapter, the last chapter. We must love Jesus, we must love as Jesus loved, which means not in some kind of arrogant, superior, judgy way. All the wacky people in this world who seem so lost, the Lord adores them. Right? All the really broken, sinful guys and girls, the Lord is so in love with them. We have to love like Jesus loved. This is going to take a grace and a gift from the Holy Spirit. Three, our lives must speak the truth before our mouths utter anything. Good word, Father Ken. Our lives must speak the truth. If they don't see it in you, they're not going to believe it when you say it to them. You have to be different. You have to be lifted, joyful, freer. Not perfect, but on a journey to freedom. And it should show. Four, we must be genuinely joyful. Same sort of thing, developing that idea in our disposition. True joy is rare in contemporary life, Ken says. And the Spirit, one of the most un fakeable marks of the spirit working in someone's life is joy. Five, we, have, we need to have a vibrant, loving, welcoming community to invite people to. Ain't that the truth? We need community. Vibrant, loving, welcoming place where the people to whom we are proclaiming the word can come and see it lived out. Keep going quickly. You could give a whole sermon on any number of these ten. Number six, there needs to be a place where people can hear the word proclaimed. This is true. And at the risk of... I'll say it anyway. Catholic parishes, is there many of them where you can go and expect to hear a clear, powerful proclamation of the gospel. That needs to change in this church. As the good people in encounter ministry say, Jesus didn't die for a powerless church. Anyway, let's keep going, don't get distracted. A place where people can hear the word proclaimed leading to repentance and faith because faith comes through hearing. See the door. Walk through the door to the person that's standing on the other side. Faith comes from the proclamation of the gospel through hearing it. Seven, we need to be committed to accompanying those who encounter the Lord through our ministries and our proclamation and our witness through walking with them. We have to actually do what Jesus said, which is make disciples. And we're talking about this as branch council, you know. We're pretty good at putting on events. Millsy is awesome at putting on events. And many extraordinary graces flow in our events. We drop the ball after the event, I reckon. We have to get better at walking with people. Proclaim the gospel and then walk with them. And that can be unglamorous and messy and inconvenient. But that's the the other side of the coin. (laughs) We walk with people, we make disciples. Right, okay, three more. Uh, Discipleship involves instructing and modeling and the embracing of disciplines of the Christian life. You know, the best thing you can give give to someone, apart from telling them about Jesus, proclaiming the gospel, is teaching them to pray. Which A sort of kind of assumes you know how to pray yourself. So important, honestly. Just absolutely vital to learn to pray, to be deepening in prayer to be going deeper in prayer and then teach people how to do it. It's all talking itself. Nine, sacramental life. We love this one, especially Eucharist. But baptism before Eucharist, people 
receive fully the gift of their baptism, which is one of the ways that we talk about baptism in the Spirit. But Eucharist, every time you go, you meet Jesus, the risen Lord. Every time I receive, I receive on the hand and I say, the resurrection is on my palm. I encounter resurrection. Jesus the Lord, risen, crucified and risen. How amazing. And lastly, for the evangelized, those who've heard the call, who've seen the door, who've walked through the door, who've encountered the power of God to save them, they have to tell others, to share what the Lord in his mercy has done for you. As Jesus said to the guy who was set free from not one but a legion of demons. He wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to become one of his uh, close disciples. Jesus said, go back to the people at home and tell them what the Lord in his mercy has done for you. Okay, the full circle. All right, that will do. That's just scratching the surface of Ken's excellent chapter, the last chapter in this book on eternity. If you haven't read it, make sure you do read it. Thank you so much. <laughs>